will Trump's accusations affect our already fragile markets? I'm here with Jim Rickards, who joins me right now. He's the author of Currency Wars, along with Mark Smith, a senior fellow at King's College. And on the phone, we have Yale University's Stephen Roach, former head of Asia at Morgan Stanley. Good to see all of you. Uh, Jim, again, uh, referencing Trump, he's going to speak any moment. He's going to tell us China does not play fair. Does he have a point? Well, he's right. I mean, China is a currency manipulator, but everyone's a currency manipulator. Europe, the United States, the currency wars have been going on since 2010. They're going to probably go on for five. We'll be talking about this five years and, and Just to back up for the viewers, so when you say everyone's a currency manipulator, is it because we, uh, we're all willing to print a little too easily? I mean, you think about what we did here in the United States, thereby depressing the value of our dollar? Well, there's a whole toolkit. The, the problem uh, in the world today, Trish, there's too much debt, not enough growth. It's as simple as that. So how do you get growth when you can't get it through productivity? You steal it from your trading partners by cheapening your currency. All the world has been doing is taking turns. 2010, cheap yuan. 2011, cheap dollar. 2013, cheap yen. 2014, 15, cheap euro. Okay. Now it's China and the U.S. turn again to have the cheap currency. So well, if, if we know together. everybody's doing it, yep. and so China is as guilty as the rest of the world Correct. at doing it, how do we get an advantage over China right now? Because we want to make sure that you, the U.S., is productive, uh, but right now it seems to be coming at, at an expense. Well, this is the Shanghai Accord that came up in late February. What, what they're trying to do is maintain the peg between China and the U.S. and then cheapen the dollar. So we'll get an advantage vis vis Japan and Europe. So basically what we're trying to do uh, is import inflation in the form of higher import prices. Mm -hmm. U.S. is a net trade deficit. Um, so Europe sort of accepts this. Japan, you know, they're not going to intervene because they've been told not to. They've been threatened basically by Lagarde and Jack Lou. Don't you dare intervene. They're not going to. I see the end, you know, trading through 100. Um, Mark, as we uh, look forward to Donald Trump speaking about China, uh, this is an issue that obviously resonates throughout America right now because people have seen their jobs disappear, if not to China, then someplace else overseas. How do we start to regain an edge? Well, I think the, the easiest way to regain an edge in an economy is to take the barnacles off it. That means lower taxes, remove as many lawyers as you can from the business process, reduce the number of regulations, do all the things that the Barack Obama administration, frankly, has not been doing, which has not been very friendly to business. Mm -hmm. So I really think that the way to view this, Trish, is I'd like to use the example of the lawn. The American businesses and the American economy is like the lawn. If you simply remove the rocks of regulation and taxation, the lawn will grow. And what's been going on with this administration, unfortunately, for the last eight years, is we keep putting rocks and rocks and rocks on the lawn preventing it from growing. And by the way, I think that yeah, Brexit I mean, that's really speaks to that exact it. same issue. It, we'll, we'll get to that I in a second. I think it's a major component of it. it, it, it it's I one component, component of it, but of you know, it. at the same time, you get China that's willing to uh, steal our intellectual capital that is, uh, you know, employing people from, at, at much cheaper rates. I mean, how do we compete in a global sure. environment but, but when Trish, China is so far ahead of us in terms of the, uh, the cheapness of its labor and uh, the, the capital it's willing to put forward to, to grow its economy overall. But Trish, no one really wants to do business with China. No one really wants to do work in China. Let's be clear about that. But why the not? They got a billion American people. Of course you want to be there. Yeah, the no, the reason why American businesses make the choice to leave the Midwest to go over to Asia is because they can get engage in labor arbitrage and environmental arbitrage, and basically the cost of production is cheaper. But one of the ways to fix that is to basically make the production of jobs, the creation of jobs, less expensive than it is currently okay. in the United States. All right. and the major so get rid way of the red tape, get rid of the regulations, taxes, lower taxes. Get rid of the red tape, okay. and people will stay I, I, in the United I, I, States get, and I'll not get, go uh, overseas. Mr. Roach on the line, too, and I, I want to get his thoughts on this. Uh, Stephen, where are we at a disadvantage right now when it comes to the trade deals that we've negotiated with China? Well, uh, Trish, I think... Um, Rather than view this as a one-way adversarial relationship where China is robbing us of our economic livelihood, I think we need to <clears throat> take a long and hard look in the mirror. We run trade deficits last year with 101 countries. Uh, by higher math, excluding China, that leaves 100. And it's because we don't save as a nation. And, you know, it's not about gardening or, you know, fixing your lawn, as was just alluded to. It's about sucking it up and moving away from an excess consumption economy, cutting budget deficits, which is exactly the opposite of what Donald Trump is going to do, and boosting our savings so we reduce our current account deficit and our multilateral trade imbalances with 101 countries, uh, including China. 
we need to negotiate with them toughly on, you know, a number of the issues that you've addressed, whether it's intellectual property rights, market access. <laughs> but come on. I mean, this is part of the Donald Trump mantra. Let's blame Mexico for drugs. Let's blame uh, the Islamic um, uh, religion for terrorism. And let's blame China for jobs. And you're what about you taking a look in the mirror and accepting some responsibility ourselves? You know, I heard a lot of good ideas in the way of, okay, we need to do a better job ourselves. And, of course, Mark's point about we need less regulation. Um, but, Jim, back to you for a minute. You know, when if, if I'm making something here in the United States and I'm trying to export it anywhere in the world and I'm sending it over to China, if they're slapping a tariff on that good, my product is not as competitive in China as uh, as it otherwise would be. And if they're shipping things over here and I'm not putting a tariff on it, then their products in turn become more competitive. And yet we love all that cheap stuff we get at Walmart from China. Yeah. So, so how do we continue to really reap the benefits of cheap goods, but at the same time not destroy what we're able to manufacture and create here? Well, you're right, Trish. It's not just tariffs. It's also non-tariff barriers. The famous case, you know, the Japanese once banned French skis because they said Japanese snow was different than French snow. I mean, a lot of ways to play the game. The classic case in uh, August 15, 1971, Richard Nixon put a 10% across the board tariff on all imports, every single one. Mm -hmm. Now, he didn't want a 10% tariff. What he wanted was to get Germany, Japan, and France to agree to devalue the dollar. He used it as a negotiating tool. And? That's how I see Trump, sort of threatening tariffs, maybe putting some tariffs on, not because he wants tariffs, but because he wants a better ah. deal on intellectual property. You know, Trump's, hey, Trump's you, you, you got to talk tough, he's right? The, he's the art of the deal, <laughs> absolutely. Unfortunately, I'm out of time, but thank you so much. Good to see you all, Jim, Mark, and Stephen. Appreciate it very Thanks, much. Trish.